Okay. I think I just got the go ahead <laughs> that we can start this, uh, this webinar. So thanks very much to, uh, to people for inviting me here at WITS at Amsterdam. It's a real pleasure for me actually to be here, uh, as you can probably imagine. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Dutch. I grew up in uh, Zeeland. Uh, so for, for those of you here in the Netherlands, I'm a Zeeuwsmeisje. Uh, I spent the first 18 years of my life there and then moved to Delft University to study uh, mathematics, computational mathematics. But uh, from 1990, I've Mar been... Uh, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. Hicham? It's fine, it's fine, go ahead. Ben Nick Live? Yeah, you can start, it's, go it's fine, go ahead. Zal ik opnieuw beginnen? Nee, is prima, start maar. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, some, uh, some technical confusions here. But anyway, so I, I left uh, the Netherlands in 1990. And uh, after about a year of playing, I ended up at Stanford University in Silicon Valley and did a degree in computer science and, uh, and computational mathematics. And I was there at the same time as uh, a lot of quite famous people in Silicon Valley right now. I'm not one of them. I'm just an ordinary professor at Stanford. But I was in computer science at Stanford together with the two Google guys. Uh, I was also there together with Vishal Sika, who uh, became the CEO of Infosys and the CTO of SAP. And also around the same time as Jensen Wang, who is now the CEO of NVIDIA. And so you can just imagine what an exciting time it was because for those very successful people, for every successful person, there were, of course, many more who started smaller companies uh, or tried to start companies. And, and in the 90s, this was a, already a really happening place. And, and that, of course, is, has just gotten uh, even better or worse, depending on your perspective. I left for five years after my PhD and went to New Zealand, uh, but came back in 2001. And ever since then, I've been back at Stanford as a, as a faculty member. I'm having a, just a wonderful time. So this is the campus that is now closed. So it, it, at the moment, it looks probably just about as empty as, uh, as on this picture. Um, unfortunately, with COVID, well, the silver lining is that I can actually be here without having to fly over to, to Amsterdam. Uh, but of course, uh, I would have much preferred to meet all of you live in, uh, in Amsterdam itself and, and uh, have a drink afterwards and, and talk a little bit more. So we'll do that some, uh, some other time. Uh, but one of the silver linings for me has also been that I've actually moved up north. So I am broadcasting this from Bend, Oregon, where uh, my, uh, my partner and I uh, now live uh, during COVID. So I'm teaching from, from Bend and, and also doing my research from there. So greetings from beautiful, frosty Bend, Oregon. So uh, like I said, Silicon Valley, uh, where, where Stanford is and where I've spent about 25 years uh, is, is unbelievable when it comes to data science. As you no doubt know, many, many companies, it's just a little screenshot that shows you uh, the variety of those companies. And it's no surprise, of course, that at Stanford faculty, as well as students work with, uh, together a lot with these companies. In fact, Stanford itself is very entrepreneurial. And many of these companies, of course, came out of Stanford. Um, and here is just a, a, an idea of what this activity really is. So to give you a sense of uh, what kind of uh, environment we're embedded in. Um, so at Stanford, we've had thousands of externally sponsored projects that, that are sometimes or regularly lead to uh, a startup. We have lots of licenses. We have lots of companies in which we actually, as a university, hold equity. Um, we have Stanford Research Parkland with 150 companies. And, you know, these are numbers that, that are, of course, a, a, a little bit uncertain, but over close to 40,000 companies were really created by alumni since uh, 1930. So Stanford, of course, is university is probably as, as old or approximately as old as, as Delft University. Um, but since 1930, we've had these companies spin off and, and they've created a lot of wealth and, and of course, many jobs. So an exciting place. 
And being there from the 90s at the same time as, as data just started taking off has been super exciting. So just in the minute or so it takes to cover this slide, uh, the amount of data created in just this minute is, is just mind boggling. And, and you probably are aware of this, but still I love big numbers, so I'd like to put them on. So millions of YouTube videos viewed. If you are on Tinder, then you know you're one of 1.4 million swipes. Uh, over 200 million emails sent, 4 million internet searches. And, and in the next few days, you know, we will be tweeting a couple of billion tweets. Um, there's lots of petabytes of data created just on Facebook, lots of messages on, on WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp. But it is not just social media that is uh, put down here as well. So from today till post-COVID, maybe another year, I, I hope a little bit faster. But um, per year, there are about 400 satellites put into orbit. And there, is, there are trillions of dollars spent on IT. And a big chunk of this, an increasingly large chunk of this, goes into artificial intelligence and, of course, data science. So, so the money invested in this, the data generated, and, of course, these satellites are used for Earth observing, for communication, um, for all sorts of purposes, uh, military purposes as well as civilian purposes. And the amount of data that they create on a daily basis is, 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 is unbelievable. So we're in this period of data where data is penetrating all areas of science. And here is a, an overview of, of, of all areas of science. <laughs> Uh, and you see, therefore, the science approach quickly shifting. And so uh, I look at this and, and maybe people in the 50s, in their 50s, who are listening to this talk, you know, my age, uh, see, have seen this also. We, we've gone through a very interesting uh, and, and maybe for, for me and for others, certainly also very exciting shift where we see science uh, really shifting from data supported to be a data driven. And when I say it's exciting for me, it's not because I think this is so incredibly uh, amazing and, and now science is in such a better place. I think there are actually many unintended kind of negative consequences of this. But a shift like this, of course, is, is also really changing the way we do business. And so we're busy. Uh, in academia and, and we're busy in industry. But the shift has gone from data supported science where data is used to inform our models uh, through coefficients, for example, maybe through a little bit of calibration, but, but mostly for checking after on relatively sparse data and just informing physical or other coefficients that we have in a model. And then it shifted to being data inspired. So we got a lot of data. We got some insights through that data and that inspired us to create more models and, and to develop new research. So there's been this wonderful interplay between observational sciences and, and the design of new methods and, and um, the exploration of new areas of science. So this is what I call the data inspired age. And now it's mostly data driven, at least many, many places are, where the data just comes first and last and is there also in the middle as the meat of everything that we're doing. And in fact, you see a lot of people now saying we don't need the old traditional models. We can just replace them with machine learning or, or now what of course is, is, uh, is the buzzword, deep learning algorithms. And we don't even need domain experts. I have companies, I've seen companies around Silicon Valley who say, just give me your data. That's all we're interested in. And we'll give you your answers. And there's a lot of problems with that approach. There's also some, some fascinating results that you can get, some unexpected results, but there are also just a lot of problems too. But in any case, we are seeing this age of the data scientists. And, and some of us say under COVID, it's actually the age of the introvert data scientists and engineers. So I'm, I'm really uh, naturally quite an introvert. And so this is the age for me, I would say. Um, but uh, it's an exciting age. And, and what do data scientists do and data engineers? They, of course, 
help frame the question and I put that on the left. That is what we should be doing. But most of the time, data scientists and engineers are working in the middle. So they collect and correct data. They do a lot of wrangling of data and remediation of data. This actually, for a lot of people, is a big surprise when they start in data science because they spent most of their career, so it seems to them anyway, uh, doing wrangling uh, of the data, getting, getting the data to work, fixing up the data. And I've had uh, alumni from Stanford to say, my goodness, I spent 95% of my time actually wrangling. Um, then there is an analysis and understanding bit, which is sort of data mining, where you're probing the data to see what actually do I have? What does, it, uh, what does it tell me? What does it not tell me? At least that's a question that should be asked. What does it not tell me? Oftentimes uh, uh, people uh, forget about that, that bit. Um, and then we go to this uh, very interesting uh, and, and, more, and maybe some people would say more sophisticated area of using the data to predict out, to do optimization. And that's of course, uh, machine learning is part of this. And, and AI, so application and, and prediction. And then the last bit, of course, is visualizing and reporting out and explaining the data. And again, you know, that's sort of on the side for many data scientists and engineers, but it's really, really important as a practitioner to also do that because it helps you communicate your understanding out and it also helps you get feedback on what you've done and uh, and that helps you correct what maybe what you've done and so you understand some of the the flaws in that too so a tremendous amount of activity in this and many many things happening and these are just examples of projects that i've either consulted on or worked with or or heard about or have very close colleagues working on uh, at stanford or or elsewhere and you can read these uh, these yourself. Uh, the ones in red, of course, are, are in dark red are some of the uh, activities that are, are a little bit uh, dodgy and, and questionable. And um, some of the, the ones in white are can be extremely powerful and very positive. And so altogether, it's a little bit of a mixed bag, a, a mixed bag of, of good and bad and, and concern and, and, and uh, delight and enlightenment uh, as well as, uh, as the opposite of that. So data is the new whatever, right? It's the new bacon, oil, or gold, whatever uh, you fancy. It's big and it's really increasingly critical. Um, and I mentioned this before. And so you hear this, everybody's jumping on it and, and also everybody can jump on it. And one of the big things right now is democratization. And people say, you know, data is, uh, everybody can do this. Uh, we have public domain software, we're sharing codes, we're sharing data. When you have codes, black boxes, if you like, and you have data, you know, people can, can play with this and we have true democratization. It's accessible to, to everybody. Now, of course, that's not quite true because for a lot of the algorithms that, uh, that you have, you need either a lot of data, not everybody has access to that. And you also need, of course, fantastic computer power. And that is absolutely not available to everyone. So we still are in a situation that despite of this democratization, that the real power in data science really sits with the very few. So this the democratization is not really taking place uh, as much as, as we'd like. And when you look at this also globally, you see most activities concentrated in just a few areas in the world. Now, what I find really exciting about data science is that because of tools that are available and because of more and more data sets that are being shared, and, and because you don't need, you're not geographically constrained by data science, you can share that really easily on the internet, which is available in most places in the world. You should be able to really make this a global industry where no matter where you are, you can uh, make headway in this and you can earn a living. In other words, we should be able to share this unbelievable wealth across the world. Yet that is not quite happening because of what I said really earlier. So we do see monopolies and we do see concentration in, again, mostly the Western world. And, but also, of course, and now in, in, in India, which is a, 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 a big area, and, and we increasingly in, uh, in China as well. This map is from 2019, and the 2020 map probably looks a little bit different. 
Okay, so let me uh, just go on a small soapbox here a bit on black boxes. And, and sometimes I call this my grandma five minutes because um, it shows my age, I suppose. So let me take you back a few decades. So a few decades ago, we were in this age of uh, democratization, if you like, of computational mathematics. So we had public domain softwares made available like LA Pack or um, the BLAST routines. Uh, compute power was getting cheaper and cheaper. Algorithms were available to many people. We had the first uh, commercial, but very cheap for educational purposes, uh, simulation codes made available. We had a lot of optimization software that was made available. And we saw this incredible change. And, and may I say democratization of computational mathematics software and, and computational mathematics research and practice. And that actually led to a change in the way that we educated engineers. And it had a blowback time. So we, for a while, we had this hype where everybody was applying everything to everything. And many little mom and pop shops, if you like, sprung up as well in the area of, of simulation. And we had this unbelievable um, search of computational um, uh, activity. And the reason for this was exactly the same reason where we see this now in, in uh, machine learning is a lot of public domain software, a lot of cheap software, relatively cheap so software, and a lot of contractors and consultants who said, we can do this. Just give me your problem and we will give you the answer. Just like now people say, just give me your data and we will give you what you want to hear. Now that led to, as I said, a, a big blowback and people got burned. And so this is my grandma moment saying, we have to be careful that we don't go that same route. And I think we are, uh, it's actually hard to stop. When you have this hype, people will just, will jump on it and will think maybe through this a little bit more later. And this wonderful example of Boeing and particularly one person at Boeing in, in the early nineties, who really did something about this. So this was a guy called John McMasters. And unfortunately he passed away. Uh, I had the fortune to work with him a little bit on the project uh, for National Geographic. And, and he was just a brilliant engineer, but he saw engineering students come into Boeing with really the wrong skill set. And what he said is they leaned too heavily on computers and didn't understand what they were analyzing. And this is, of course, the problem that you have when you're focusing mostly on those black boxes, these public domain softwares that you're using without really understanding. Now, I'm a faculty member who teaches courses in computational mathematics. So, of course, I would say that, that it is so important to understand what's in it. But it is also really, really important to always put what you do in, in great perspective. So, but what, one of the things that I wanted to, to point out is that the research community really came together and we started creating comparative solution projects to make sure that what we were doing was of sufficiently high quality and that we were not just blindly applying black boxes. We did establish best practices. We established minimal QA and QC for publications and we redesigned education and training. And we got to do this now ourselves as well, I think, with machine learning. I see many, many, many publications and many reports out without really good quality control. And people are, are um, uh, putting things out like crazy, you know, very, very fast with maybe too little scrutiny. So be careful there. Okay, and, and the other thing is also a lot of companies initially outsourced, they got really excited, they saw the competition do this, so they said to be at the leading edge, we got to do this, but then they got burned, and then gradually started building this in-house capacity, really focusing on these foundations, and in fact, that is what I see happening in a lot of industries now, that they say, okay, we have a data science group, within the company, but the management actually doesn't quite understand what they're doing. And maybe don't, they don't always understand exactly what sort of black boxes they're using. So let's build this in-house capacity. And at Stanford, you know, we work with a lot of companies to try to do that. 
So one of the things that I see now a lot, and, and now I'm going to go on another soapbox, and that is the soapbox of the reviewer of, of data science work as either a consultant or as a reviewer of journals. And I see this often. So just give me this tool and I'll jump on that data. And right now we see that people jump on data a lot with deep learning. You know, deep neural networks are, are the, the game right now. And of course, these networks are intriguing. They're amazing. They're just, to me, as a mathematician, huge tweak um, algorithms, and, and it is uh, sometimes very surprising what they can do, but it is also uh, maybe sometimes very surprising that we don't really understand what they're doing. Well, actually, that's not surprising from a mathematical point of view, but a lot of people are surprised by this. So we don't really understand what they're doing most of the time. And if you cannot explain why you get an answer, of course, it's extremely difficult to understand that you're actually doing something that's either biased or that's just wrong. Um, so what one of the things that we always hammer, and, and, and I wanted to just emphasize this also, that it is so important here to not just jump on these tools, but to really think about this question first. So don't make the data first, make the question first, and think what tools are actually most appropriate for answering the question. And no, the answer not, is not always a deep neural network. In fact, the answer may be linear regression or something relatively simple, and, uh, and you will get sometimes further than that. So sometimes I feel that, uh, you know, people in the industry and also in academia are like, like baby bang bang from the Flintstones that they have this big hammer, which is a deep neural network, and they just like to bang on everything with it. So uh, let's not do that. Okay, so then, of course, we also need to think about the data that we have. And, 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 and that's the other thing I just wanted to emphasize. We have to really think about where data comes from, who collected it actually, for what purpose is the bias that crept into the data. Um, I see a lot of people just using data sets without asking that question. Where does this data come from and why was it collected in the first place and by whom? And so we need to really understand what's in it, what's missing from it, how to adjust this for data imperfection, which we always have, what analysis are actually appropriate for the data, is the data rich enough for certain analyses, what questions this data and the analysis can actually inform about and what questions they cannot, um, and how robustness can be measured and results verified, if at all. Okay, and of course, where bias can and will creep in, uh, and who needs to be consulted? Now, this all takes time to do this and to do this properly. And we're all in such a rush to be the first to do something, to be the first company to bring out an app, uh, to conquer a particular area of development and own it and, and make a lot of money out of it or become very famous doing so. So we're all in a big hurry and uh, sometimes we're missing this out, but here it is. And I just want to put this here as grandma. So that was my grandma moment. Now, one of the things about uh, data-driven decision-making, which we're using more and more, is that they really should bring together all the sciences. And that just makes me so excited. So when you think about these big questions that we're hoping to address also with data, the wonderful thing about this is that in order to really answer them, we need everybody. And so I see data-driven decision-making as an area that could potentially bring all of these sciences together and for a university that is wonderful, for society that is incredible and for a company, of course, that is also very exciting. Now, a few more res uh, observations from the review deck that I see. So I, I suppose I'm still a little bit of a grandma right now. There is a, still a huge problem that I see in the work that's being done between uh, understanding the difference between calibration and prediction. So what is being calibrated and what shows truly a causal uh, relationship. So the difference between correlation and causality. Um, I hear this a lot. If we just have more data, then the AI algorithm will be better, but that's not always the case. That depends on the richness of your data. And sometimes the more data and the more subtleties in the data will make it actually harder to get robust and reproducible results. Uh, I see a lot of people uh, looking at data and discovering really interesting phantom patterns and relations. I've had some wonderful examples from the energy industry where I worked, where people started seeing things in reservoirs or in, in earthquakes. They're really not there, uh, but they think they can, can spot this. And, and if you don't have domain experts in your team, 
who really understand the physics very well too, that can lead to some very interesting, um, very interesting deductions and, and, and very entertaining at times. Uh, and of course, there is uh, th this tremendous amount of bias, which means that, that there is a, a, a lot of worry about AI. And for those of us here to the, to, together today in this field, we have to own this. We have to own this bias. We, we really have to think about this. We're the ones creating this and we should own this and do something about it. And so here are just titles of the last couple of months, newspaper articles, uh, articles in, in magazines. And one of the negative unintended consequences, of course, of, of this is that trust in what we do and trust in science is going down quite rapidly. So we must own this uh, uh, for our own good as well as the good of society. So, you know, it's time to get our act together, I would think. Uh, so we need really a shared glossary in the common language. I know some groups are working on that, but we don't really have that. In fact, even at Stanford, we're still discussing, you know, is artificial intelligence the umbrella under which data science sits? Or is data science the umbrella under which AI sits? Or is it really computational mathematics under which everything sits? Of course, as a computational mathematician, I think that that's the, that's the case. Uh, we need robustness metrics. We need minimal robustness trust requirements for publications, including reproducibility. A lot of people are hammering on this. So this reproducibility, sharing code and data and, and, and saying to people, hey, here is what I've done. You, you check it, you try this also, and you can see that what I've done is, is correct. That uh, would be great. And of course, comparative solution projects and, and benchmarks. And let me be a little bit Dutch cynical here and say that needs to be more than databases of cat pictures. Um, and we need recognition beyond the paper citations. And this is for those of us at the university. We need recognition for really well-developed code. We need rec recognition for, uh, for uh, data acquisition, data wrangling, and data sharing. All right, and, and then the other thing is, of course, we need open sharing of failures and rewarding publication of negative results. And we're not there in science in general, and we're certainly not there in data science. Okay, so there's a lot of good stuff, um, of course, too, and, and I could talk about this, but I don't have to, because you're probably listening to this seminar because you are absolutely into data science or curious about it, you're already convinced about all the good stuff that it can bring. And hey, I wouldn't be working in this area if it wasn't all very good too. And there weren't a lot of really exciting things to, to, uh, to talk about. But here I wanna segue into this uh, question of women. So I am uh, one of the co-founders of Women in Data Science that we started in 2015. And sometimes people say, well, why did you do this? Why, why create a, a, an organization for women in data science? And, and this organization now is global and, and we're bringing together thousands of women ar around the globe. So we really hit the nerve. And, and I have to take you back to, to 1984. So this was me in 1984 when I started my studies. And this was at Delft University. Very, very few women. So I was wondering, where are all these women? I mean, I'm excited about studying mathematics at Delft University. Why aren't there more women excited about this? So this is a long time ago now, right? This is, this is more than 35 years ago. And um, we had very few women there. Now, the, at that time, I thought that certainly by the time I was old, and according to my 18 year old self, I'm pretty ancient right now, um, everything would be better, but it's not. So if you look at data related to computer science, and that's the red graph here, you actually see the number of graduates from computer science um, really go down. Um, so it hasn't gotten better. In fact, compared to the early 80s, it's gotten worse and there are fewer women. Um, we also still have a huge problem with retention of women after graduation in engineering. So we see a lot of women leave the field. We have an extremely leaky pipeline also when we look at promotion of women. So women are leaving, retention is a problem, but also not that many women are being promoted. So women are still underrepresented, and I've been hearing about this for nearly four decades. 
we still have things like this happening. And you may have seen this. So women in math, for all women who love math, with four male speakers. Um, so where where are the women, right? And so like I said, it's, it's really uh, quite bad right now. And that makes me uh, very sad and also a little frustrated. And of course, I've been teaching a lot of students over the years. I started teaching at the university at, at Delft um, as a summer teacher and a teaching assistant, and I've been teaching ever since. Um, and you know, one of the things that we we see, of course, as a result of having so few women, is that this data-driven decision making that is so critical and is creating so much wealth mostly sit with the men. And I'm not now even talking about other underrepresented minorities, because you see the same thing, if and actually worse, with black data scientists and data engineers and uh, being there in very, very small numbers and any other type of diversity. You know, so I'm just talking about men, women, so I'm focusing on cisgender, but of course we have to also think about uh, people with other genders and, and we also see very few people there. So mostly it is white and sometimes Asian men who are owning this piece of uh, the world. And they're helping make the decisions, they're helping drive the software development, and they're sharing the wealth. And if we truly want democratization of this, and we want to serve the whole world, then we need to have people doing this development and making those data-driven decisions that are representative of, of all of us. And so we're not there, not by far. And worse, we haven't made any progress, even though we've been saying this for decades that we should. So this is me 30 years later. So why is this? Well, uh, when I'm teaching, I still see this. So there are lots of myths. Uh, in fact, there are two big myths that are persisting and cultures persist too. And there is this, this myth that there is this big difference still between men and women. So here are the two myths that I see as an educator and practitioner. First is the myth that success in math and computer science and engineering just simply requires a really, really strong innate ability. In other words, you cannot be successful unless you have a high doses of natural talent. Um, hard work won't get you there, you know. Uh, if you don't pick these things up straight away when you're a teenager or when you're in undergrad, you will never pick them up. Well, that's just not true. And, and this has been debunked so many times. But it's still, it's still this, uh, there's still this myth. And I've seen this in courses that I teach, that people that are a little slow in the beginning can really become extremely successful. Uh, and there are people that are just a bit behind when they're starting at university because they have not, for example, programmed while they were high school students. Now, the other myth that really is the killer for a lot of women is that there is this myth still that girls simply have less of this innate ability than men. Women have less than men, girls have less than boys, and that's also been debunked, but it still is very much alive with the result that many women, even very good women in this field, often start and, and often stay feeling like an imposter, that they may not actually have what it takes to be successful. And this is, of course, uh, 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 further propagated and, 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 and um, you know, with the culture. Because if you have a culture that is mostly of a certain type, may, mainly uh, men who have done this from early on, have a reasonable innate ability, believe this also, um, they may not hire people that are different and that coming up with, um, a, a through the ranks in a different way, maybe at a different pace or people that simply look a little different. So you have this also that people preferentially hire like people. So we got to break through this. So how to change this culture and how to do this? Well, one of the things that uh, we, um, we hear a lot uh, is that, well, as a woman, why don't you conform now? And then when you get into an organization, you can change it from within. 
Well, I heard that in the 80s, I've heard this in the 90s, and it's not really happening. Right? So culture is really hard to change from within. The other thing that we, of course, heard is to lean in. And, and I was a, a, a little bit um, taken aback when this book came out, because that, that's something that we've heard for a long time also. And, you know, and both of these really say the onus is on the women or the onus is on the underrepresented minority. We conform go in and then change the culture. We lean in so that we find uh, an acceptable and accepted place for ourselves and then can change the culture. But I really think that in all of this, the onus should not be on the minority. The onus should really be on the majority. Um, together, of course, with the minority, but we have to take ownership of this. Uh, we have to take ownership as white people of a culture that is uh, biased against Blacks. It's our problem, not the problem of our Black colleagues. And the same with men and women. So enough already, I would say, and we started this campaign called 30 by 30 that we're really trying to get in this field of data science and computational methods, 30% of everyone being um, female or uh, non cisgender male by 2030 uh, and 30% not at the start level but at every level okay so that probably means higher percentages at the lower levels but that's what we're aiming for and and we're sort of rallying uh, around this uh, because you know a more inclusive culture is just good for everyone as I've been saying now, when it comes to data science, you know, there are many brilliant women in data science. So there's absolutely no reason for any woman to feel, hey, we can do this and we can do this as well. And here's just a few. And, you know, when I started thinking about this, I thought, how come that um, those women, these, these fantastic women are not always promoted? How come that we still have lots of conferences where there are only male speakers? And that is really what got us to start women in data science. We say, hey, there are brilliant women. Let's just start promoting them. And let's start promoting them in the same way that men are being promoted at conferences with only male speakers. And so we organized this technical conference that just happens to have only female speakers, but it's open to everybody. Uh, so we, that's how we start Women in Data Science as this conference, this meeting, where we profile outstanding work done by outstanding women. And it's our goal to inspire women to join this field and stay in the field, so support women in the field as well, and educate everybody regardless of gender. And this is not educate them as I've just been doing, uh, climbing on my soapbox and said, this is how you should do things differently. What I mean with educate here is really sharing uh, technical advances that were developed by, by women and, and by these outstanding women and celebrate that and, and see this. And we started this with one conference on campus at Stanford in 2015. Uh, we had 400 attendees and we got, uh, really without thinking about it, uh, we, we, we put a live stream together, uh, but we didn't advertise much and we got 6,000 people or so on that live stream. So we, we thought, wow, we really hit a nerve and let's uh, scale this up. And we started scaling this up through sort of a, uh, a hybrid model, if you like. So we, we use ambassadors around the world who set up their own local conference uh, in their own region and we're live streaming still from Stanford from a central conference. So people can use this live stream and then can put on local content and create local networks as well. So now we have over 200 events every year around the world. And in the last years or so, uh, during the WITS uh, events and the WITS conference, we get uh, together through these conferences and the live stream uh, over 100,000 women and men around the world. And this is really in, in many countries uh, led to, uh, you know, a wonderful um, uh, effect of more women joining, more girls turned on to data science and, and willing to enter the universities and studying this and more women staying because they found uh, a support network. Just the same way that a lot of our male colleagues have their own uh, support networks. So that's just wonderful. 
Uh, and here is just a screenshot of all these women from all around the world and, and a few shots here of various events. And you can see uh, all the different uh, locations represented if you look at skin color and, and, and dress. And, and, um, and it's just been incredibly inspiring. And of course, with COVID, we had to go uh, to events like this. Um, now, our BITS conference this year was March 2nd. And two days later, Stanford and Santa Clara County and most of California shut everything down. So we were really worried for a while that we were actually a super spreader event with WITS. Uh, uh, but we got our own WITS in just before that. And, and afterwards, all these other WITS uh, events had to go virtual and, um, and change it really quickly, like this event in Japan. They jumped on it within just a couple of days and changed their whole conference from face-to-face uh, -to, -face to, uh, to virtual. Amazing um, how fast that, that happened. So this WITS community is leading to, uh, to lots of wonderful stories. And, uh, and, and this is a feel-good slide, you know, some, some of the, the stories that we hear from people. And, and here is another. Uh, from from uh, uh, girls and, and young women in, in some other parts of the world. Uh, we also do a WITS datathon. You know, one of the things that we see is that this, uh, this excitement about data science for a lot of students at high school and middle school starts with participating in hackathons. Uh, and these hackathons are designed really to appeal to... to uh, uh, people that really like this sort of gaming atmosphere and culture. You know, let's get together and hack th something out in 24 hours. We won't get any sleep. And, and it's just like one big game. And that is still a world that is not as open and inclusive of, uh, of girls. It's also not as open and inclusive, by the way, of, of introverts uh, necessarily, right? Uh, if, if, they, if they're team-based. And, and so we like to change that. And we started this datathon that actually lasts for a bit longer. So we, we give people several months to work on a problem. We allow them to work with people from all around the world. So last year we had a thousand teams, but many of them had never met each other. So they were not teams, you know, three students from Holland, but they may have been a student from Delft and a student from uh, Nairobi and, and a student from, uh, from Perth in Australia working together on, on this problem. And they're open to men as well as women, but we ask that at least 50% of every team is actually uh, female or identifying as, uh, as female. And so that's worked really well. And we have a lot of first timers that participate in this datathon. And we see a lot of those first timers um, then go on to more datathons and hackathons and really get an interest in, in this type of work. Most of what we do in the datathons is for global goods. So these are really interesting problems for social goods that, that has a very broad appeal uh, to many people across the globe and, and across all sorts of uh, diverse backgrounds. We run a WITS podcast. Uh, I'm the host of that podcast where we interview uh, lots of different women. We're now in our third season, and I, I, I highly uh, encourage you to listen to some of these podcasts with the really wonderful stories of women in this field and their career path and the problems that they're working on and the contributions that they've made. Um, so I would say for WITS, explore at uh, witsconference.org. That's our website, so you can find everything there. If you're interested in setting up not uh, WITS at Amsterdam next year, but WITS at your own, comfort, uh, your own company or uh, in Eindhoven or Rotterdam or Breda or wherever you want in Groningen uh, or anywhere else in the world, please let us know. We'd love to have more events in the Netherlands and we certainly love to have more events in Europe and everywhere around the world as well. And, and I would just leave by here by saying, hey, support and, and teach each other and hire and promote each other and, um, and everybody, uh, not just people that look like you. So let me stop here and thank you for attending and listening. And uh, you can reach me very easily uh, at uh, margo.gerritsen, so first, dot last name at Stanford at EDU. And you can find me actually easily also by just Googling Margo with a T and Stanford, and I should come up. And I just wanted to see if there are any questions right now on the live chat.
Hey, I don't see any questions come through here, but again, I'll be very welcome to, uh, very happy to answer any questions you have uh, also later on. So please comment on the video or uh, send me an email or find me of uh, find me on, on Twitter or find us on Facebook or LinkedIn. We have a large LinkedIn group also with Wits. So hope to see you there. And thanks very much for listening to uh, this seminar for Wits at Amsterdam and, uh, and uh, have a fantastic uh, weekend. And I hope to see you at future Wits events. And thanks very much uh, again, uh, oh, there is a question. I was just going to say thanks very much again to people for organizing WITS. And the question relates to this. Is that do you, you have anything more to dream for WITS the next years? Um, you know, we, um, we are really going into outreach now also. So we, we've, uh, we've done networking and community building through conferences, through, through the podcast. We've done some outreach and um, try to be a little inspirational and lowering barriers through the data phone. But one of our big interests is to go into outreach to high school and middle school, because a lot of the myths that, that, that I talked about, they start really early. They start in, um, in elementary school, even if, you, um, if, you, uh, if, if you're looking at this and they certainly are pretty clear in middle school and high schools. So we'd like to do outreach there. We also working with colleagues who are very interested in setting up data science education in high school periods. So uh, our type of outreach is, is through educational material, but not through course development. But there are definitely organizations that say, hey, in high school, apart from just teaching algebra and calculus, and traditional statistics, we also really should create courses in, in data areas to make high school students much more data savvy. Because with data-driven decision-making becoming so important, everyone really should be data savvy. And so we need to have data literacy and um, we're hoping to help out with that. So, so that is one of my big dreams is to, to really make a contribution there. And then we are in, um, in, in nearly 70 countries around the world, but there's more countries in the world. And we are on all continents apart from Antarctica, but we'd like to get more, um, more countries represented. And with some of the countries where uh, there really is a very, very small percentage of women active here, think, for example, about Japan, where you know, it's really still very, very hard for women to penetrate also management levels and to work in these sort of areas. We'd like to get a stronger presence. In the next few months, uh, we have um, uh, the Datathon starting. So the Datathon starts uh, at the end of the year, uh, early next year. So that's coming up really quickly. We also now are at the time where the ambassadors come together to develop plans for next year. So next year, um, our own conference, which is at Stanford, which has uh, always been to the central live stream conference, is going worldwide. We'll have a 24-hour event where we're going through the world in three uh, regions. So the Americas, uh, the Middle East and Europe, and then uh, the Asia and, and the Pacific areas. And we'll, we'll go through uh, around the world in 24 hours, featuring women uh, from all of these different areas uh, uh, proudly, and, and also looking at themes and topics in, in our talks and in our discussions that are uh, really relevant to each of these areas as well as, as, as globally. So we're very excited about that. And a lot of the ambassadors are helping put this worldwide event together. So that's cooking now. So if any of you listening things say, hey, I would like to contribute to that, let me know. Just send me an email. And then we have more podcasts come out as well in, in uh, the coming months. Um, and if you look at our website under education and outreach, you will find some new materials. We created some short videos to explain to uh, the younger students uh, in, in middle school or high school uh, what data science is. We have some videos that uh, follow uh, women data scientists in a day in the life. 
uh, which is always really interesting to people. So there are some material out there that you can access and, uh, and, and use. Right, well, thanks very much for your questions. And maybe now is a good time to close this, uh, this seminar. So thanks again, people, and uh, have a good day, everybody.